I'm John Carter in Moscow, in Havana, Cuba. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, right here in communist China, reporting from India. Hi, I'm John Carter in the Solomon Islands. I'm John Carter in Soweto, from El Salvador. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia. John Carter explores our liberties threatened. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter. Welcome today to The Carter Report. When I got out of bed this morning, I opened up my Bible to the little apocalypse. That's Matthew chapter 24. This is a great prophecy about the end times. It describes our day. And it says that in our, in our times and in our day, our freedoms are going to be challenged. In fact, our freedoms are going to be taken away. For this reason, I've invited today an old friend, attorney Alan Reinick. Alan comes from the great city of New York. Alan is a Jewish gentleman who believes in Jesus and who believes that we're living in the last days. Alan is the executive director and general counsel of the Church State Council. He's got some amazing responsibilities. He is a, a fighter for freedom. He has many lawsuits. He's defending the rights of people whose freedom is being taken away from them here in the United States of America. Today, we welcome you, Alan, to the Carter Report, and we are so glad that you have joined us, and we welcome you especially also, my friend. Greater Manila is more than 20 million souls. Almost all these beautiful people are ignorant of the true gospel of Christ. Manila needs Jesus. 35 years ago, John Carter came to Manila. Pastor Carter is returning to Manila with an urgent assignment. Preach the gospel of Christ and the great truths of the Bible. Don't water down the message. Make it plain, make it clear, make it Christ-centered. The Carter Report needs your help now to light a fire in the Philippines. Your gift will help open the doors of bondage, smash the chains of sin, and open the gates of paradise to thousands of lost souls. The churches have sent out an urgent plea for the Carter Report to return. Help us proclaim the true gospel of Christ to the beautiful Filipino people. Please send your support to the address on the screen, visit our website, or call the Carter Report. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter. Welcome again to the Carter Report. Here in the Carter Report studio in beautiful Southern California is Alan Reinick, Esquire attorney, a great defender of the rights of individuals as far as freedom is concerned. Alan, welcome today. It's a delight to be with you, John. Uh, you've been with us before. I have. And I'm a glutton for punishment. I'm back. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Um, let me ask you this question. You're an attorney. You specialize in freedom, religious liberty issues. Is America today in a dangerous place? Yes, we are. The culture wars have been a huge threat to all of our freedoms. And the threat is, is sadly from both the left and the right. Each side wanting supremacy in the culture wars is willing to go to great lengths to win and to take away the freedoms of, of the other. You're a student of the Holy Scriptures uh, because of your Jewish Christian background. You know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't you? Yes, well, they could agree on very little except the need to crucify Christ. Yeah, uh, the left wing, extreme left and the extreme right um, they could agree on very little in theology, as you say, except to crucify the Messiah. Do you see a parallel in our times? The spirit of intolerance is, I think, the unifying theme. It's been very um, obvious 
and, and you know from the right in terms of intolerance of Muslims, for example, of immigrants. Uh, from the left, there's similarly intolerance uh, against Christians. There is indeed. Yeah. Yes. So you know if there's something that both sides have in common, it's uh, you know the spirit mm. of intolerance, which which mm. is you know let's let's put our cards on the table, John. That you know, Jesus is a spirit of love. He died to save everyone. Yes. The spirit of hate and intolerance comes from somewhere else, from the enemy. Uh, I've had the privilege of being attacked from left and right. We're, uh, you're in, I'm in good uh, company then, uh, th John. That's a good place to be because it shows that you're in the middle. <laughs> but I've discovered that people from the far left are, are tremendously intolerant. They want freedom for themselves and freedom of speech for themselves, but not for you, so it's, not for me. It's a my way or the highway ethos. Yes. Right? Uh, if you're, you know, an advocate for lesbian and gay rights, then uh, if you don't agree with them, yes. uh, you know, they want to trample on, on your right. And take away your freedom of speech. But if you're a conservative Christian, uh, you're just as happy to take away the rights of lesbians and gays. So you think that the, the far right in America and around the world is also like the far left, a, a threat to our liberties, our freedoms. Look, John, look, let me give you the big picture here. Mm -hmm. the, the genius of America is a place where people of all differing beliefs can live together in peace. What about Muslims? Our founding fathers uh, and religious liberty advocates of that generation specifically included Jews, Catholics, Muslims, saying America is a land of freedom for everyone, uh, not just for Christians. So it, it would appear to this pilgrim that a lot of folks have forgotten that. Or never knew it. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, I tell my kids <laughs> I forgot more than you ever learned. <laughs> I'm sure they, they're impressed by that. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, so uh, let me ask you this because this is where you specialize. What's so wrong with a union of church and state? When I first came to America, I was in the great state of Texas that I love with all my heart. I, I love Texas. And my neighbor said to me, it's going to be great when Jesus is the president of, of, of America. When Jesus is the Lord over America, what's so bad about that? You know, Judas wanted to make Jesus king too, uh, but he would not have the earthly throne, would he? Um, look, when church and state come together, it is the historic formula for oppression and persecution mm -hmm. because those who believe they are ruling in God's name and doing God's will, feel justified in doing things that um, if they didn't have uh, uh, religious justification, they would blush, they would be ashamed of. I've got a theology, Alan, that you may share or else you may not share. I believe that before the second coming, uh, it, that's called the rapture by evangelicals in North America, uh, even though the term rapture is nowhere found in the scriptures, but not to argue over that point, I believe that before the rapture or the second coming, there comes a tremendous time of religious intolerance. Indeed. And persecution. Indeed. Uh, do you think the, the stage is being set for this, this scenario? Absolutely. It is being set and... You know, Christians, I think, are blind to the role that they are playing in this. You know, you started this discussion alluding to Jesus' great uh, teaching in Matthew 24 yes. about the end mm. time. The little apocalypse, it's called. Yeah. Now, Jesus did not warn us about deceptions that would be Muslim or Hindu. He didn't warn us about deceptions in the name of Buddha. He said, many will come in my name and deceive many. Even the very elect, he warned, would be susceptible to deception. Yes. So the final round of intolerance and persecution before the return of Christ 
is done in Jesus' name. Christians are sucked in. And what we have today, essentially, is the religious right, Christian in name, uh, pursuing political power as a substitute for the lack of spiritual power. This is pretty hot stuff, really, if we follow this through to the logical conclusions. Alan, I want to read you a text uh, that's found in the, uh, in the Apocalypse, the big Apocalypse, and that's in Revelation chapter 17, if I may. And then I want you to comment on it because you're a, a scholar of the Bible too. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore, the great harlot. Babylon the great, the yeah. mother of harlots yeah. and abominations of in, the earth. In scripture, the harlot is the harlot church. It is. A woman represents the church. A good woman is, is the good church. A bad woman is the bad church. And she's pictured here atop the beast. It says, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Exactly. What does that mean? And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So regardless of what any nation's laws or values may be about the relationship between church and state, mm. the Bible here very clearly says, using the symbolism of fornication, that the intimate relationship between yes. church and state An unholy is immoral. Yes. Okay, fornication is a, an intimacy that is forbidden. Yes. Right? It's, it's an immoral intimacy. Yes. And what the Bible is describing here in the last days is church and state are too cozy. When it says here that the woman is seated upon the beast, it means that the church is seated upon the state. Is this true? You know, uh, it certainly seems like the one who's on top is the one holding the reins uh, and calling uh, the shots. Uh, uh, That's what the imagery suggests uh, to let me. Let me read on. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So every Bible commentator, Alan, says that the woman in Bible prophecy is the church. Right. And the Apostate woman is the apostate church. Christians who've lost their way. And then it goes on to say, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. But if I may interject here, yes. John. Yes, there's plenty of theological uh, you know, debate and, and differences of views among the various denominations. That's not what this prophecy is addressing. No. You know, if I may, in, in the system that leads to the mark of the beast, mm. the mark in the forehead and the hand is a sign of belonging to the beast, it which is an mm. earthly, it, it, what it is is instead of having our faith and trust and allegiance to the creator God in heaven, to mm. Jesus Christ, yes. the church has put its trust in princes. Yes. It has put its allegiance yes, in the and state. It, it now belongs, it, it, you know, it belongs to the beast instead of belonging to God. So it's not so much, you know, there may be doctrinal confusion yeah, no, no, it's and, not and doctrinal about, issues, yes, yes. But, but primarily it's really talking about, you know, who are we putting our trust in? Mm, totally, yes. Now, there's something else here. I've just noticed this. It says, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, a drunk person is a bit of a crazy person, isn't he? He can't think straight. When we think of people being intoxicated, we think of it, you know, like getting high, being yes. happy. You know, yes. they're excited yes. about this alliance between church but they and can't, state. But they can't think straight. You know, it's like, you know, fans, you know, when your team scores a, a <laughs> touchdown or whatever, you know, yeah. you, get, you get all excited and yeah. cheering. And, yeah. you know, that's, to me, that's the, the image. Everybody's like cheering on. Yes. Just like, uh, forgive me for jumping the gun here, but the church in Germany was thrilled that Hitler was restoring national greatness. And they were intoxicated with, the revival of the nation. Tell me about this, because not everybody knows about this. It seems to me that we have either forgotten or else we never knew. What happened in Germany? 
You've alluded to it. Tell well, us. Well, you know, Holocaust scholars tell us that 80%, fully 80% of the Lutheran Church, or which more. was the or. dominant church in mm. Germany, mm. Were, were very strongly supportive of, uh, of the Nazi party uh, and uh, supported the, the gradual uh, ostracizing and elimination of the Jewish community. And, and any dissident. Right. And not only the Lutherans, Ellen, but the Roman Catholic Church. Well, indeed. And some say it, it uh, I think you're being very kind when you say 80%. Some would say that 95% of the German people, Lutherans and Catholics, got behind the Fuhrer. He bit hard to believe, had, isn't he it? He certainly had very strong support. Uh, uh, you know, from the Christians. He, he campaigned on a program of being against uh, decadence. Yes, you know, that's Berlin, good. That's good. Uh, Berlin in the 1920s was a very decadent place. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, he was vegetarian. Mm -hmm. He would give the right like religious <laughs> language, uh, you know, saying nice things about the church. And uh, people ate it up. And... One must bear in mind, and you won't misunderstand this, and neither will my audience because they know what I believe on this. Hitler had a point in that he wanted to restore Germany's fortunes. Mm -hmm. Hitler had been given, you know, a, a terrible deal after the First World War. Germany, you mean? Had uh, yes, yeah. yes. Well, Hitler fought in it, and Hitler had been given a bad deal too. He was a little corporal back there. But Germany was treated very badly by the Allies, by Britain and France and the United States of America. Well, they did lose the war after all. They did lose the war, and, and uh, we believe that. Right. We believe that. Their they economy it. was in a shambles. There was they uh, were driven into the macro, ground. Macro uh, inflation. Yes. Hyperinflation. I mean, up to what a million percent or something. Or... Go to the store to buy some groceries with a wheelbarrow full of. Uh, Bills. Yes, yes. Literally. And if you did it in the morning, it was better than the afternoon. <laughs> because in the afternoon, you needed two wheelbarrows. Two wheelbarrows, yeah. And so Hitler wanted to make, restore the glory, the legitimate glory. Of the nation. Of, of Germany, the nation. Sure. And so he was saying some nice things about the church, and he was against decadence. And the Christians, you say 80%, I say 95%. Of the Catholics and, and the, the Lutherans. Yeah. And not only the Lutherans, all of the Protestants got behind him and shouted, Sieg Heil. They put their trust in princes. Yes. Well, the Psalms and other places, the Bible, so clear. Mm -hmm. And I think the message of Revelation, which, remember, is a Jewish book, picks up of on those. Of course it is. It picks up on Say those that again. themes. How do you know it's a Jewish book? Well, the writer of it was Jewish. <laughs> and, but, but of course, Jesus wasn't and it, Jewish. And, and the language and imagery of it is all filled with allusions to and quotes oh, from the Jewish Bible. It's all the Old Testament. Right. The book of Revelation is based on the Old Testament. So these now, messages of Revelation 13, 14, the whole mm. Mark of the Beast passage. Before you get on to this, was Jesus Jewish? Yeah, he was. Are you sure about that? I, yes. Well, <laughs> and, and this the, is what I tell my family. You know, how can you give me a hard time for being a Christian when now, I'm now, believing in a Jewish Messiah? Yes. You know. Now, you're a Jewish gentleman who believes in Jesus. I've been called worse than gentlemen, but thank you, John. Yes, yes. no, we're being nice here today, <laughs> Alan. And you come from New York. I do. A Jewish attorney from New York. Yes. What are you doing on my program? <laughs> <laughs> you invited me. <laughs> of course. So we what have, were you thinking, John? <laughs> we have a Jewish heritage. Our Lord was Jewish. All the apostles were Jewish. The Ten Commandments are Jewish. Yeah. The book of Revelation is Jewish. All the New Testament except for Luke was written by Jews. Yes, indeed. Luke and Acts. And so now you're talking uh, about the... The mark of the beast. Let me ask you this. Not only are you an attorney, uh, but you have, you have a special burden in your soul um, to defend religious liberty rights and, and also the rights of people not to worship. That's, uh, you, that's you been my calling. Yes. Yeah, and you defend... Uh, Mormons. We defend people of all faiths. And Jehovah Witnesses. 
Uh, but, but you wouldn't offend Muslims, would you? I have some Muslim, is, uh, Muslim clients. You have some Muslim clients? I do. Yes, of course, that's the Christian viewpoint, isn't it? To defend uh, the weak. That is the ultimate Christian viewpoint. We, that's what Jesus would do. We practice the golden rule. Of John. course. You know, um, we believe that everyone has the freedom of conscience. Yes. And, uh, you know, we'll, if, if someone suffered religious discrimination, we will represent them. Yes. Let me ask you this, because I don't want to throw this away too quickly. Did Hitler seem to be the savior of his people he and was, of the Christian church? He was regarded as such. Now, as you know, because of your Jewish background, Hitler was totally opposed to socialism. True. I'm opposed to socialism. Okay, that doesn't make you a Nazi. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. You're getting back at me now. <laughs> um, Hitler saw the evils of communism, socialism, Marxism as a tremendous uh, threat to the Christian heritage. And that's why he, he hated Russia so much. Now, I've been to Russia and Ukraine. 49 times. I know socialism. I know communism. Philosophically and theologically, I am opposed to socialism and communism, all of those things. Now, Hitler was opposed to socialism and communism. And because there were a few Jews who were in favor of, of socialism and for other reasons, he became opposed to the Jews. I'm not sure that's why he scapegoated the Jews. I think it goes a lot deeper than that. Tell me more. Uh, he was envious? You know, authorita the authoritarian uh, impulse needs to have an enemy. Yes, it does. The Jews, a scapegoat. Jews were the convenient scapegoat. Yes, we've got to find some bad guy. Who was going to be blamed yes. for what happened to Germany? Yes. Blame the Jews. Yes, and so... Uh, what Hitler did, he picked out these people because they became, in their own language, a convenient uh, scapegoat. And so he persecuted them. Uh, and he did this uh, for the good of Germany and for the good of the world. At least that's how it appeared in the eyes of some people. Now, you were referring a moment ago, Alan, to... The prophecy of Revelation 13 about the mark of the beast. Can you tell me more? Without getting into the speculation about the literal or, or symbolic, mm -hmm. you know, what, what the mark is or, or how it's manifest, what Gentiles tend to miss is that this is a counterfeit of what the Torah says. In the Torah, which are the five books of Moses, Tell me more about this. Three times God commands the Jewish people to put his teaching in the forehead, in the hand. And the way they did yes, that, yes. I call it phylacteries or little boxes mm -hmm. that you put little Torah scroll, little scroll inside of, and you wrap it around your head and you pray with it on. In Exodus was the first time, in Exodus 13, then in Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11. So if you want to know what the mark of the beast is a counterfeit of, we have to look at what was the genuine, what, what was the point of putting God's instruction in the forehead and the hand. And the Exodus story is really the story of the plan of salvation of the gospel itself, deliverance from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. It's the, it's the whole shooting match, really. And in Deuteronomy 6, you have what's known as the Shema. It's the central declaration of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Mm -hmm. And it's a statement, Monotheism. and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And these words which I command you this day, uh, you shall teach them to your children. When you walk by the way, when you, you know, rise and yes. fall, mm. and bind them mm. as a sign on the doorposts of your house, your forehead, and your hand. So... To counterfeit the Shema, to counterfeit uh, in the Mark of the Beast is really about who do you belong to? You know, we're told we belong to God. We're in relationship to God. 
he's our God, we're his people, and we love God, and we put our trust in God. The mark of the beast is all about a counterfeit where we've let go of putting our faith. The church is no longer relying on the power of God and trust in God. It's now relying on the beast, and its allegiance is in the beast. Its trust is in the beast. That's why it's the mark of the beast. So, so the mark of the beast ultimately is a is a denial of the concept that we trust in God alone, but now we're going to trust in the state. Is this what you're saying? It's not so much a denial of the concept, but the reality. It's the reality that, you know, look, we can say we believe in God and we trust in God, you know, but is that how, how we live our so, lives? So, so, so people who, in the last days, who are getting the mark of the beast, they'll be sprouting a lot of religious talk. Yes. They'll be talking, probably praising Jesus. Yes. You think they'll be praising Jesus? Absolutely. Jesus warned us that they will be doing it in his name. Praising Jesus? Yes. They get the mark of the beast. Yes. And the mark of the beast is the mark of the Antichrist. Well, now you're bringing in a, another whole concept yeah, no, of but Antichrist. This is, well, the mark of the beast is a bad thing, isn't yes, it? Yes, it certainly is. Because those who get it, according to Revelation 14, will face the wrath of God poured out undiluted, full strength. Now, you know, the wrath of the beast is one thing. The yes. wrath of the state, <laughs> you know, I, I, yes, don't, yeah. I don't relish no. the wrath of the state. No, we don't. But the wrath of God... That's a million times worse. Undiluted. Undi not just, you know, his mm. pinky or his hand, yeah. but full strength. The wrath of Almighty God poured out upon those who... Violate. This is, but this is why I laugh at the whole notion of the Battle of Armageddon. Because how how do you fight against God? You know, you're gonna yeah, get no. some nuclear missile rocket launchers and <laughs> fight against God. I mean, it's it's absurd. Of course it is. Now, in our next segment, we're going to go back a little bit to um, religious intolerance. We're going to talk about that a little more. We've started in this segment. We're going to follow this up after we have a break. But then I'm going to read to you, Alan, and have your commentary on Revelation 13 that talks, wait for it, <laughs> not just the mark of the beast, but the image of the beast. Now, if I say to you, your son is the image of you, that means he looks like you. So the image of the beast is the copy of the Antichrist power that is portrayed in the, in the scriptures. When my son would get frustrated with me, mm. I would say, and he'd call me names, mm. I'd say, well, you know what you are. You're the <laughs> son of. <laughs> You're the image of. <laughs> uh, we'll be back in a few moments. We're talking today to attorney Alan Ronick, and we're talking about religious liberty threatened today in America. Stay with us. We'll be back. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.